I'm going to talk about so the prevention of um, cryptococcosis and other AIDS-related fungal infections, which is a mouthful. Um, but really, sort of what I'm talking about is really going to be about crypto and uh, telomycosis, and so f and, and so that's also sort of penicilliosis uh, for those that uh, are not uh, telomycosis uh, uh, experts. Um, and so when you think about just the challenges of fungal um, opportunistic infections overall, um, I think the audience is, is fairly familiar with this, that there's um, invasive fungal infections are a major cause of AIDS-related deaths, probably um, with you know very uh, varying degrees of case fatality rates, uh, whether it's sort of cryptococcal meningitis and routine care or other um, uh, AIDS-related uh, mycosis on, on the, the lower end. So kind of a, a quite a, a wide variety of a high spectrum of case fatality rates, um, whether it's uh, crypto, crypto, whether it's pneumocystis, uh, histoplasmosis, or Taylor mycosis. Uh, and overall, this is, contributes to a substantial amount of um, the burden of AIDS-related deaths, um, probably on the order of about a third um, globally. And part of this is really due to uh, stable numbers of people presenting into care with advanced uh, HIV with low CD4 counts, uh, people defaulting from care and re-entering into care with low CD4 counts, uh, people with undetected virologic failure, uh, as well as non um, uh, non-HIV populations that are at risk for fungal infections due to rising uh, immunosuppressive medicines. And so cryptococcal antigen screening is recommended for those um, below 200 and especially below 100. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the background on that and some uh, data on that. And then um, really sort of talk a little bit later then about uh, Taylor mycosis as a, another example. And so the reality trial, which was a, a trial that was published in the New England Journal in, in 2017, uh, demonstrated that a, a sort of a package of advanced prophylaxis that involved fluconazole, as well as cotrimoxazole, INH, and azithromycin um, reduced mortality. And so reduced mortality was about 3%, but it was a statistical reduction, but relatively modest absolute reduction in mortality. Um, and really the, the, the benefit of that package in a factorial design was really driven by the fluconazole. And, um, and so this, this hasn't really been widespread implemented in Africa, and it's not totally relevant really in Asia um, where t uh, telomyces uh, is sort of the more common opportunistic infection than, than cryptococcus. Uh, and so typically you'd use itraconazole for that, and so fluconazole um, may not be sort of a relevant package. And so really talking about this, um, what, what are the challenges about, about this uh, that are really relevant uh, to the Asian Pacific region. And so overall today I want to talk about crypto, I want to talk about telomycosis, and uh, start a little bit about just the, the uh, Craig lateral flow assay, talking about uh, cryptococcal antigen prevalence rate, um, outcomes, and some, some data on ART timing, which is new. Um, uh, and then talking about Taylor uh, uh, Mices, which I, I feel a little bit um, out of place here, but um, Dr. Lay was kind enough to give me a few slides on Taylor Mycosis and talk about what data there is on antigen prevalence and is there a role for screening. And so with cryptococcus, um, so unmasking of cryptococcus is a common phenomenon. This may be not always recognized, but there's clearly a subclinical period prior to meningitis. Uh, and when people unmask disease after they start antiretroviral therapy, there's a much higher mortality uh, in our data in Uganda. It was a twofold higher two-week mortality rate of 50% versus our sort of typical 25% mortality rate uh, in hospital. And the cryptococcal antigen is detectable in blood at least three weeks prior to the onset of headache. Uh, and so from time from onset of headache to when people show up to hospitals, another two weeks. And that was with the old latex agglutination test. The new uh, cryptococcal um, lateral flow assay, or LFA, is, has a higher analytical sensitivity. And so that three-week window is probably even longer, um, in, into the, um, longer than, than three weeks uh, on average. And so in one community cohort, at least in Uganda, it, it, it uh, was associated with 18 percent attributed mortality. And so there was sort of data on sort of there was burden in Africa. People sort of knew about this. And so, but the problem was with latex agglutination wasn't really um, something that could be rolled out uh, very easily in, in a low resource setting. And so um, the, the first LFA was developed and FDA approved in the U.S. in 2011. And we did one of the, the initial validation studies um, for that. And now there are five different manufacturers um, of the, the lateral flow assay. So only one is, is FDA approved. Two are CE marked in Europe. Um, and so that's the IMI and the Biosynex. Um, and there's uh, two that have, have undergone fairly large validation studies, uh, including the Lemon uh, Bio. And so of the other three manufacturers, three of them are made in China. Um, and um, one, at least one of them uh, has a, a fairly good validation study, and one is uh, where we have an ongoing study. And so the lateral flow assay is just a sort of immunochromographic test. It's very simple. It's a dipstick test. Um, doesn't really require any 
um, infrastructure and uh, has room temperature storage and is very simple to conduct. And so our diagnostic performance with this uh, was quite good, and so we published this back in 2014. And basically, the, the lateral flow assay was the most sensitive uh, diagnostic test. And at the time, we sort of um, had a problem of, of how do you prove something is better than the gold standard. Uh, and so when we first implemented this uh, test, the first two patients um, where we just had a lateral flow assay that was positive, we, we basically thought, oh, this is a terrible test, this is a false positive, and so we kind of, the patients weren't treated. And then they came back uh, two weeks later, and the, the first patient with the false positive had culture positive meningitis, and then, and then we called up the second patient, and that, that patient had, had recently died. And so we realized, like, ooh, this is actually a much better test uh, that is more sensitive. And so um, this is borne out in our sort of follow-up data. Um, still, this, the sensitivity is about 99.5%, and, and so occasionally misses a test, and you occasionally get a false negative, um, but it's a, quite a good assay, um, more sensitive than latex agglutination, more sensitive than culture. And so with this, when you have um, cryptococcal antigen prevalence in blood, um, in a couple different retrospective cohorts, um, basically uh, it predicts uh, the onset of future meningitis um, if it's untreated. And in Uganda, when what we published in 2010 was among the people who, who were treated, they did quite well. Um, Long-term follow-up through two and a half years of about 75% uh, survival versus the people under a CD4 count of 100, um, all of them died. And so a relatively small cohort, but the Kaplan-Meier curve was, was pretty stark. Um, that a little bit of fluconazole seemed to be a much better thing than just giving HIV therapy alone, that when people unmasked disease, they did not do very well. And so when we uh, compared this to our outcomes uh, in, uh, of people with symptomatic meningitis, they had the same CD4 counts, the same viral loads virtually, the same demographics, just one was treated earlier with fluconazole, uh, and really relatively short courses of fluconazole did much better uh, than the people that, that developed meningitis. And so there's been a number of, of studies now published in blood, um, of the prevalence rates in, in blood, so either serum or plasma. Uh, and overall, sort of the average in low and middle income countries is around 6%, um, sort of in the middle there. But there's a number of studies uh, from Asia, so from Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Indonesia, sort of various prevalence rates, some are a little bit higher. All of these have a 95% confidence interval, and so, um, but sort of around 6% in general when you look at, at uh, populations uh, with CD4 counts uh, under 100. If you look at hospitalized studies like the Cambodian study um, and some of the Thai studies, higher prevalence rates. If you look in outpatient clinic, uh, slightly lower uh, prevalence rates. So does this really work in the real world of can you screen it and treat to decrease mortality? And so in one nice study in um, uh, it was published in 2015 in uh, both Tanzania and Zambia when they looked at CD4 counts under 200 when they did both Craig screening with fluconazole preemptive therapy as well as some ART adherence support over the first month. Um, they were able to reduce mortality by about 5% uh, absolute and so there's about a third reduction in mortality. Um, this was a fairly large study, uh, multi-site, and was sort of a real-world implementation study. Um, and so for this study, they gave fluconazole for basically two weeks and then uh, at higher dose of 800 milligrams and then did 400 milligrams for eight weeks. And um, still of the people who were identified as Craig positive, about a third of them died. Um, and most of those deaths were before four months. And so better than 100% than mortality, but still not, not perfect. Um, the reality trial I, I mentioned before, one of the interesting things is they gave 100 milligrams sort of prophylactic dose um, every day for, for 12 weeks. Um, and when I sort of have done the pharmacokinetic modeling, you know, when you project what, what the drug level would be, about 40% of people wouldn't even have a therapeutic drug level. It would be less than the MIC, um, at least in blood, and even less than that in tissue. And so it's sort of unclear to me, at least, why that trial worked um, uh, and, and whether, that was, um, whether that's reproducible. We'll sort of skip through that. And so what we do in our sort of screening program that we run in, in Uganda is that um, we basically do a lab-based reflex screening. And so when people get a, a positive HIV test, the initial um, is to get a CD4 test. And so with the CD4 test, if it's under 100, they get an, a lab-based reflex screening. And so this um, has been implemented um, sort of locally and also on a national scale in South Africa. So throughout the whole sort of um, national health laboratory system in South Africa, um, they Basically, for any CD4 count under 100, it's uh, automatically reflexively tested for cryptococcal antigen, and their prevalence rate is about 5%. So overall, they run, I think, it's about, um, about 3 million CD4s a year in South Africa, of which 10%, so 300,000, are less than uh, 100, and uh, the prevalence rate is about 
And so of the people who are Craig positive, we basically try to get them back in clinic as soon as possible, assess them for symptoms, if they're symptomatic to a lumbar puncture, and if, if not, then I'll start them on uh, preemptive uh, therapy. And so we looked at this uh, in a trial. It was a step wedge randomized trial design in Uganda um, where we had an observational phase and then we sort of rolled, rolled out um, the uh, cryptococcal antigen screening. Unfortunately, the trial was really confounded by a, sort of there was a doubling of the clinic sizes when the, the WHO um, sort of um, going from 350 to sort of treat all uh, approach. And so the clinic size doubled in this time period. And so fewer people came back to actually start HIV therapy. And so there's a 9% less um, people starting HIV therapy in the intervention arm. Um, and so there was no effect on survival, but, it, but the survival wasn't worse. And so perhaps that's a, a marginal sort of victory. And then with an 8% uh, rate that we treated and a 9% worse um, HIV therapy initiation rate, it was sort of a wash that there was, there was no... Uh, improvement in survival, but there was no worsening in survival. So um, unfortunately, there was not a statistically result. One of the, the things that we did find out in the trial was that really the baseline uh, Craig titer is quite informative of risk of, of death or meningitis um, over the next six months. And so the threshold that we picked was around uh, basically 1 in 160, that above that threshold, equal to that or above that, um, the, risk fact, the risk of death was about two and a half times higher. And when your titer was basically 1 in 80 or lower, uh, it was basically about a 10% mortality risk, which was the same as if you were a cryptococcal antigen negative. And so the background sort of rate in the population was about a 10% uh, six-month mortality. And so that sort of higher tire, titer um, rate we've then sort of looked at in a number of different cohorts, and we've, we've pooled that data. Uh, this is in a recent um, um, review article that sort of Basically, as your titer goes up, not surprisingly, your risk of, of mortality uh, goes up as well. And so that's not totally equal because when you sort of, when people come back to clinic, some of them are symptomatic, some of them are asymptomatic. And so one of the questions, the clinical questions that come up is when do you need to do a lumbar puncture? And so we, we've looked at sort of what's the risk factor of your serum or your plasma, Craig titer, versus risk of, um, of uh, having CSF positivity. And so on the left side, uh, here, basically, you can see that in the people who are asymptomatic, so meaning that they don't have a headache, um, that is your Craig titer is fairly low, sort of one, uh, one to 80 or, or lower. Um, the vast majority of people don't have a CSF positivity. Um, and as your uh, titer sort of jumps up to above one in 1280, um, about 60% two, about of people are, are uh, positive in CSF. Conversely, if patients come back with some sort of low-grade headache, uh, they may not have frank sort of meningitis. Um, but once again, you can see that the, the proportion that, that, have, um, that have CSF, uh, cryptococcal antigen positivity, uh, is, is higher. And so this um, sort of you can look at basically, um, a, you know, low titers, you know, regardless of if they have a headache, they're unlikely to have um, CSF positivity. Conversely, even in the asymptomatic people that don't have any headache or any CNS sim symptoms, once they get a high titer, um, they're much more likely to have a disease uh, in uh, the, the CSF. And so when you look at their outcomes to stratified by their titer, as well as whether, whether they have a headache or not, um, basically the, the low people, even with a high titer with, with CSF sort of negativity, negativity um, have worse outcomes uh, when their titer is above 1 in 640. Uh, in those that are symptomatic, um, the threshold's a little bit um, lower that basically people with one, 1 to 160 or higher um, both have sort of equivalently sort of poor outcomes. And so you're looking at a six-month mortality rate of, um, you know, over half of these people. And so uh, certainly the, the preemptive therapy of just fluconazole alone could likely be improved uh, in these populations. And so the, really the, the clinical question is when do, you, when do you really need to do a lumbar puncture? And so the most guidelines say you should lumbar puncture everyone. You should do a diagnostic um, tap. And so it's not always really feasible, especially if you have a nurse-run clinic um, or if, if you're in sort of a remote um, setting and you may not have a laboratory or other facilities there or equipment for LPs, um, as well as trying to convince patients that are completely asymptomatic um, to get a, an LP um, is sometimes sort of tricky and patients don't often want that. And so in general, people with low titers, so less than one, to eight, one in 80, are really unlikely to have CS, C, CNS involvement if they're asymptomatic and they're gonna do fairly well with this fluconazole therapy alone. Um, once your titers sort of get above the, the 1 in 640, really you need to assume that they have involvement regardless of their symptoms. And so we've been burned several times of people that, that we did a lumbar puncture, the CSF was negative, um, we gave them fluconazole and they did very poorly and they eventually died in an autopsy in the parenchyma of the brain that, that they had CNS uh, cryptococcus even though their CSF 
uh, wasn't positive. And so, so it can sort of sometimes give you a false, um, false assurance. And so really people with high titers really need to be treated like they have disseminated disease regardless of what their CSF shows. And so there's certainly a diagnostic utility in that middle range of sort of the 1 to 160 titers, the 1 to 320s. Um, but once you really get a high titer, really the question is do you need to do a therapeutic LP to lower the pressure can, and control the pressure, um, but it's less about um, diagnosis. And so the other thing that we found as we've done uh, testing on people with in blood and CSF is there's this middle group that have symptoms, so the people that have headache, that have sort of signs of meningitis, but they have CSF negativity. And so when you sort of look at this population of all comers who present to hospital um, in Uganda, it's about four and a half percent that have this symptomatic antigenemia, that they sort of have signs of meningitis, they have cryptococcal antigen in their blood, but they're negative on antigen and culture and Indy ink in the CSF. And so these people before, when we just tested their CSF, we always assumed they had TB meningitis. And indeed, of the 54, I think there was three of them that did have TB meningitis um, with uh, Gene Expert um, Ultra. But um, the rest of them just had sort just had sort of this aseptic meningitis. We assume it was early. Um, early uh, cryptococcosis, and so most of these people got treated with fluconazole initially, and the, the in-hospital mortality was 34%, which was, was actually higher than the mortality rate um, if they had um, uh, cryptococcal meningitis and were treated with amphotericin. And so to sort of beware that in the, 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 this patient population, when you see a lymphocytic meningitis and you're thinking about TB meningitis, that also to, to sometimes look, uh, can be helpful to look in, in blood uh, to see if they have this sort of early um, cryptococcal disease state um, that is, isn't um, overtly positive. And so this is sort of our third most common presentation of meningitis after so cryptococcus, TB meningitis is number two, and this is sort of the third most common um, etiology of, of meningitis that we see in our HIV population. And then obviously um, the culture sensitivity was good, but, but the letter flow assay was, uh, was better. And so when you look at timing, the other sort of um, data, um, this is sort of based on expert opinion, is to sort of look at two weeks of therapy. And so when we look at our Ugandan data, um, when we look at sort of people that sort of test and treat that start earlier and then sort of start their fluconazole, that would be the red line at the bottom. They don't do nearly as well as, as when people delay therapy and start two weeks or, or, or longer. And so the, the general recommendation of starting at two weeks is probably correct. This is the only sort of data, it's sort of preliminary data, preliminary data that we're still um, developing, um, but uh, the two-week timing uh, seems to be better uh, overall. And so sort of the summary of this, you know, it's a WHO recommendation to screen um, really when people enter into care or if they're sort of sick or present to hospital, it's uh, very useful. Uh, the preemptive therapy uh, recommendation is 800 milligrams for 10 weeks, 200 milligrams uh, prophylaxis uh, through 26 weeks. Um, is sort of one of the current recommendations really to, up to increase that dose because there is sort of that still that mortality afterwards. And that really assuming CNS involvement if you have high titers, and you don't probably need to do the whole titer series, but sort of a 1 to 160 and a 1 to 640 titer probably tell you um, if you had two dilutions, tell you kind of are they low, are they sort of high, are they in the middle. And then the ART initiation recommendation at two weeks is probably a good recommendation um, overall. So I'm going to talk a few more minutes, and I have five minutes extra maybe to talk about Taylor mycosis. And so as, as everyone in this room knows, it's one of the most common age-defining um, OIs in parts of Southeast Asia, um, particularly uh, around where we are um, uh, in uh, southern China, as well as in parts of Vietnam and, and northern uh, uh, Thailand historically. And so this is a subacute illness, just like other fungal infections, where the median duration of symptom onset is about the same as crypto, about the same as histo, where it's you know two weeks, to, you know two or three weeks, where people have had sort of low-grade smoldering symptoms, and the, there's an antigen that's detectable at time of illness. And so the question is, can we use the same principle that we have used for cryptococcus? Can we apply this to other infections? And so people want to look at this at histoplasmosis, and here in Southeast Asia, looking at um, at this for Taylor mycoses. And so when you think about um, the, the diagnosis, I think there was a nice uh, presentation earlier this morning that, you know, the gold standard historically has been culture or histopathology. Um, incubation time is, you know, for cultures is on the order of uh, days to weeks. Um, the sensitivity is, is, is fairly good. Um, skin testing, skin lesions are common in about uh, three quarters of patients, um, and that can also be cultured. There's 
PCR that's been developed, and even at time of, of diagnosis, about 70% sensitivity. And then this antigen detection, so I'm going to show some, uh, some antigen data that's been kind enough to share, share with me. And so PCR has been, has been around for a while, and so over really the last 20, 30 years, people have been working on this at time of uh, acute illness, and so when you sort of pool some of these studies together, um, really it's about two-thirds uh, sensitive. And so if you think if it, if it is missing a third of patients at time of, of uh, diagnosis, that it's probably not a very uh, viable uh, screening test. Similarly, if you look at serologic diagnosis, going from immunodiffusions to polyclonal antibodies to monoclonal antibodies, looking for both the antibody as well as the antigen, um, this has sort of progressed over the last um, two decades. And if you sort of pool a lot of the antigen tests, and this is sort of different antigens, different preparations, it's about an 80% sensitivity, so a little bit better than PCR. But I think the caveat there is not all antigens are made equal, and so some of these have different targets. And so one of the newer ones is this um, manoprotein of uh, the MP1. P uh, manoprotein, which has a monoclonal antibody that's, that's been developed. And so uh, some data that was presented this morning, um, we can look at sort of the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, man, the telomyces manoprotein that's uh, the, via the LISA format that's commercially available. Uh, you can see that there's sort of quite high um, antigen levels that are um, in patients with um, uh, confirmed diagnosis, diagnosis, and when you look at other infections, uh, basically um, fairly good um, sort of differentiation. And then sort of when you look at people with other OIs, um, you do wonder, so is there cross-reactivity issues and these are false positives, or are these sort of missed um, potential co-infections? And so that was in hospitalized patients in a study, and when you look at outpatient clinic patients, so uh, once again, we've got the culture-confirmed people, and then in a prior cryptococcal antigen screening study, um, Basically, there were a lot of patients that um, appear to have the telomyces manoprotein that was detectable. And so in the, in the study, in this sort of uh, cohort of about 1,000 Vietnamese uh, HIV-infected adults that were, um, had a CD4 count less than a, um, 100, this is across like, 21 health facilities in 10 provinces, um, the median CD4 count was quite low, so it was 25. And so both in the northern and, and southern parts of Vietnam, uh, the percentage differed a little bit. It was a little bit higher in um, outpatient settings in northern Vietnam. But the overall sort of total was, was a, a little under 5% uh, in Vietnam. And so if they looked at the outcomes of these people, that the people who were antigen positive had over a threefold higher uh, six-month mortality. These people would not have been treated. It was a retrospective study. Uh, and so, you know, one, basically one in 20 patients um, were positive and they had a threefold higher mortality uh, than the others um, who were uh, telomyces antigen negative. And so in a different study that was uh, presented uh, at Curry this year um, in Seattle, uh, a study from uh, Guangzhou, China here, uh, when they looked at adults entering into care, a lot of this was a sort of a hospitalized setting. Uh, it was almost 20% of patients uh, presenting um, had telomyces antigen. This was, was much higher than the rates of cryptococcal antigen pr uh, prevalence, and particularly in people with low CD4 counts. So CD4 counts less than uh, 50. It was up to one in four patients that had telomyces detectable antigen. And the majority of these pe people, um, so 43 or 44 of them, uh, had uh, culture confirmed uh, telomycosis. And so certainly this seems to be a, 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 um, a potential um, screening uh, test. And overall, this uh, detected um, almost most of the cases that there were antigen uh, positive in this uh, nice study that was presented at Croy. And, you know, from ELISA format, that's a lab based format, can this be developed into a lateral flow assay? And so a number of colleagues in Chiang Mai have been working on telomyces for many years. And so they had presented a PLOS one last year, um, a lateral flow assay format. And so virtually any ELISA that exists, you know, can be, it's a sandwich sort of capture thing, and so it can be uh, certainly created into a lateral flow assay. There are some challenges with, with making lateral flow assays that they do have a decreased analytical sensitivity compared to ELISAs. You do need a high quality monoclonal antibody um, in high quality manufacturing, and so there's some nuances of manufacturing that, that uh, can certainly uh, play in the role. There's certainly ways to, um, to improve the analytical sensitivity of lateral flow assays as well. Um, but this concept certainly uh, seems to be feasible. In, in their study, they had a three microgram limit of detection. That's sort of generally the, the format where it's sort of the microgram uh, quantity um, that one can detect antigen. And so, um, so lastly, sort of thinking about telomyces antigen screening. So there is a commercial ELISA that exists. It's by this uh, Beijing uh, Guantai Biological Pharmacy Enterprise. Um, 
and uh, basically that it's potentially possible to use this both as a diagnostic but also as a screening tool, uh, perhaps. And the, really the, preempt, the preemptive therapy is yet to be defined, but the classic sort of itraconazole uh, therapy, it's, it's, it's inferior to AMPO for uh, active disease, but a subclinical infection, sort of subclinical state, likely itraconazole load may be, uh, may be successful, and the sort of the, the standard sort of treatment is, is this with sort of split, uh, split dosing. And um, the question of whether, you know, for people that have higher antigen loads or do you need to, could you risk stratify people, uh, you know, is there a role for amphotericin, whether it's short course amphotericin or, or liposomal amphotericin, um, you know, potentially I think is yet to be determined. But um, certainly that um, may be sort of an exciting way to, you know, potentially prevent um, mortality in people with advanced disease uh, in Southeast Asia that have a higher risk of uh, Taylormyces.